It is a sheer delight to worship the Lord Jesus Christ with you on the Lord's day. And I hope you'll take your Bible, your copy of God's Word, and turn to Genesis chapter 3, if you will. There are some sermon notebooks that are here and available to you if you would like a copy of those. I don't think we have one for everyone, but they're here. And along with some of the other resources that we'll be posting online under the greatest story on the web page, and along with your Bible Study Connect group, we're going to try to provide you the necessary resources to make this journey through the Bible together that there is no man left behind, right? And that's the purpose of Wednesday night, so that if you feel like you're, you know, you're not quite there, maybe you missed a day or you missed a part of your reading or whatever, you come back together Wednesday, we regroup together week after week. It's a part of our discipline. It's a part of our practice, you might want to say, our corporate practice of expressing God's Word, hearing God's Word together, and discovering God's Word together, learning how to make great observations and, in, and then in, in order to make great interpretations of the Word of God. And if you take note of what Scripture says, then you'll be able to understand what Scripture says, and that's best done in the context of other believers. And so our Connect groups on Sunday morning at 9.30 and our, our uh, Life 2020 groups on Wednesday night are designed to help you with that. So where are we today? Last week was an introduction, but today we're jumping in to the creation era. And so we are going to look at Genesis chapter 3 today. And let me read to you a portion of God's word. Well, let me just read you the account because that way you understand the story and you can appreciate it. Please stand back up at the reading of God's word if you would. Yes, I, I know it's sometimes like musical chairs in here, but the good thing is, is you're getting your steps in on Sunday, right? And if you move a little bit during the worship time, no telling how many steps you might get, and we might be a little concerned about that. Verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. 
And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and flaming sword and turned away every way to guard the way to the tree of life. May God bless the reading of his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. And this, this story... Not a fable, not a myth, and not a legend, but this great story. Help us to understand it, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. So where are we today? We're going to be looking at the biblical errors, 12 errors throughout the course of this year, and we are in the creation error. I don't know if that, there it is. And so these errors will help us to understand where we are in the journey. This will create a framework by design, something that Max Anders has put together in his 30 days to understanding the Bible. I would remind you that the study, the, one of the basic um, books that we're using in this study is called 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. We're using it over the course of a year. So if you think this is too much for me in a year, keep in mind it was written for a 30-day study. That being said, we're going to slow roll this thing and we're going to use Max Anders' structure that's designed to help us to be able to hang our thoughts upon these ideas as we read the biblical accounts, as we read the stories. And so right off the bat, you read this past week, everything that God's created is good, right? And the sixth day, everything is very good. He creates man and it's a marvelous story. But then we get to chapter three. And it begins to come apart. And the story begins to unravel. How can humanity unravel so quickly? And yet we have. And we do. This story of creation is a story of how God shapes us and molds us. He creates us in his image. How he does so with such a perfect design. And yet from the very outset, all that God created is good is on the very brink of disaster. Because of the very two that he created in his image who are willing to exercise their sense of independence, fierce independence. They were free. They would become slaves. They didn't take of the fruit because they wanted to be free. They were free. When you serve the Lord, when you submit to the Lord, when you yield to the Lord, when you acknowledge him as the one true God, we all have a master. And freedom was theirs. But when they chose to disobey God and exert their own independence from him, when they chose to accept the deception ultimately of the serpent, they chose to disobey and they fell into sin. They chose sin. And so when you see the outset of this story, we see, first of all, the deception. The serpent, a beautiful creation in and of himself. The Bible says all the things that were created, we know these things are, these things are good. And yet Satan uses the serpent as a means to communicate. In fact, we know in the development of the idea of the serpent that ultimately this is the expression of Satan who is trying somehow to deceive and undermine. It's always been his case. His case. The thief comes forth but to steal, kill, and destroy. He's always been about deceiving. And we see this because he's a liar. It's not just that he lies. It's that fundamentally he is a liar. It's not that he just tells a story. It's just that's just who he is. He is a liar at the very heart of it, at the very core of his being. And the first thing he does is question whether God even says what he says in verse, the last part of verse 1. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? So he wants to, he wants to insert some doubts, doesn't he? There's this question whether God said it. And ultimately, that's a, the fundamental problem that we all face. There's always this notion, this question, did God really say that? Is that really what God meant? There's this questioning of the word of God, the authority of God's word. And, and, and yes, it is what God said. If you note back in chapter 2, and you notice in, in verse 
In verse 16, he says, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, you will surely die. It's not that you're going to die. It's like it's going to happen. Don't think that your little dabbling with sin over here is going to produce a different result than it did for Adam and Eve. There's no exceptions to this rule. When you doubt what God says and you choose to exert your own independence apart from him and do your own thing because you think you can manage your life better than him and whatever lie you're believing in that process, if you choose to do that, ultimately what you're saying is you think that, hey, there's really not going to be any consequence to my decision. And yet they roll out a big consequence, don't they? A huge one for all of humanity. The serpent is subverting. He's He's, he's seeking to, to, to undermine, to sort of rewrite the story, to change it up. It's not that he completely discards what God says. It's that he begins to, well, he begins to adjust it. <laughs> Adding to or subtracting from is a part of the problem. It's, it's a part of the problem that we face. And so there's this question whether God said it. That's the first lie. And then he twists what God says. He wants us ultimately to doubt what God says. First of all, if we don't know what God says, how are we going to be obedient to it? Which is one of the reasons why we're reading through the scripture. You you can't know that which you've not made yourself available to. And so there has to be a basic line, a basic uh, foundation of information, of truth that we're able to grasp and understand it so that we know when we're being tempted and we're being tested. When there's a subversion of the word of God, we can understand that. And today, where the subversion is greatest in our culture, and I have to be careful. I told the staff, pray for me that I'm disciplined in this message because, whoo, we could be here for days. And we can't. I'm just letting you know, I can't be here all day. I have some things to do. (laughs) Just respect my time. (laughs) But there's this, there's this, the greatest subversion of the word of God today, while there are secular forces at work, I would say that probably the, the arena in which I see the greatest subversion of the word of God is among religious people, forms of Christianity, things that pose themselves or posture themselves as being Christian. And yet in the final analysis, they don't really take God's word seriously. And so as a result of that, they begin to believe all kinds of things. And this is where we are even in the church today. Okay, let me go. Let me let it go. So they doubt the authorship of God's word. Is it really God who's saying this? Is it accurate? The accuracy of it is, is, is you know, the, the acceptability of it. And that's a large part of where we are. We, 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 if we're not careful, there's a subversion that takes place and he will twist what God says. But also he will focus on the prohibition. A liar focuses on the things you can't. This is the thing you can't do. <laughs> they, could eat, they could eat the fruit of all the trees in the garden, But this one, God was not yet, you know, the the, the timing wasn't right. There's no no reason to believe that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, it wasn't a bad thing. It's just that at least at this point in time, God has told them they're not to partake of it. And there, there is a reason. They are fully formed human beings. But I'm inclined to think, and there are many scholars who believe the same thing. We can't dig deep here. But if you want to talk about it more thoroughly at another time, we can. That while they are fully formed, they are... They are people who've been created in God's image who are developing and growing and learning. They don't know everything. They're not omniscient. They don't know everything. They've been created as finite human beings. They are going to grow and develop. And maybe it is that later in time, God is going to use this tree to help them come to an awareness in his time. It's sort of like sex. Sex is the right thing in God's timing, right? Under God's parameters. You 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 don't get to just have random sex. You don't get to just have any kind of sex with whoever you want. That's, that's not ordained by God, but within the proper parameters, it is, okay? So, so they, they are people who are told that they're not to partake of this tree, and yet he's testing them. He's saying, no, that's not really a problem. You're not going to die. It's not going to be an issue. And so the, the serpent is stimulating their, their curiosity toward the very thing that they're not supposed to have, at least at that time, at least at that, right? Okay, we can at least agree on that. You can't have that now. But what happens when you tell a little child, don't, don't touch that? You, you know what happens. They get over there and, don't, now, t- now, son, I told you, don't touch that because we're going to. And 
you, you know how they do that in their hand? They, I mean, they even do it in slow-mo. You know? And they do that. It's like they are testing you. It's the one thing you say, don't do that. Of course, we're taught we're, as good parents not to, you know, not to over-discipline, but to discipline, to redirect them, right? But he focuses on the prohibition. There's so much that they've been given. The freedom that they have. That, oh, okay. There's so much there. There's freedom that they have. But they're now going to step beyond that. And then he offers some empty promises to them in verses 4 and 5. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Oh, really? God said you would. You will surely die. Who is he to offer this kind of promise? Who is he to offer this kind of vain and empty promise nothing's going to happen to you you're the exception you can do that and there won't be any consequence to it does that ring true in your own sense of self-justification when you think nobody's going to know it really is not going to affect anybody no you sitting around on a computer by yourself looking pornography that's not going to affect anybody at all just you that you're kidding yourself husband or why, for that matter? You're kidding yourself if you think that's not going to affect more than just you. And the deceptions go on and on and on. Did God really say that? If he did, well, maybe he said it's a little different than that. And this sense of, of, of reasoning and self-justification that goes on in, in, in our process. We, we think, well, you know, we can be exposed to temptation and that we can partake of something and it really is not going to impact us. It's just, it, it's, it's like the, the, the little boy who gave, three-year-old who gave an explanation. He, he was in the kitchen and, and he was standing on a bar stool and uh, eating cookies. He asked what he was doing. He said, well, I just climbed up to smell them and my tooth got caught. <laughs> yeah. That's, and my tooth got caught. It just happened. That's what happened. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that, okay? Our sinfulness and our rebellion, when we, when we choose to, uh, to exert our own independence from the Lord. But then look at the disobedience. We, we have, there's, there's so much here that's going on. The disobedience that we see, because what happens is, in, in verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit and she ate it. Several things I want to mention quickly. She, she turned her looking at the fruit into wanting it, desiring it. Desiring the fruit more than the relationship with God. Wanting something so bad that, that, that she would make it the focus of her life in that moment to the exclusion of the relationship that should have been primary, her relationship with God. And so she turned her looking into this overwhelming desire, this lust in her own heart. And the Bible describes this process in 1 John. You might want to note this, 1 John 2.16. It describes this process. There, John talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And there was this overwhelming desire in her life that she felt like the only way that she could satisfy that was to go ahead and take of something that God had forbidden in her life. And Adam does the very same thing. It's not just Eve who does this. They are both present. It's the serpent who's speaking to Eve. But it's not as though Adam is not present. He's very much there and aware of what's taking place. They are both humanly responsible and culpable, and they are both vulnerable in this process. And so this deception in their life is now created a kind of disorder that, that in confusion that is going on so that now they go, are going to act in disobedience. And so they turn their look into lusting. They turn their desire into a decision, and their decision was that they took Look at the actions they took, they ate, she gave, and Adam ate. These are all the things that they did. They made a decision, a conscientious decision to say that I am going to exert my independence from God and find some kind of enlightenment that ended up bringing them 
into a bondage and a slavery that this world has still not gotten over. We've still, got, still not gotten over. And so their choice was turned into a chain. Ra- rather than expanding the possibilities for their life, they created limitations, right? Freedom, by definition, doesn't mean we get to do anything. That's a misunderstanding of freedom. Freedom creates for itself limitations, God-ordained limitations that are designed for what? For his glory, for our good. This is why he does these things, because he knows what's best for us. We are fully formed human beings, but we are not fully developed. We got a long ways to go. God, he lacks nothing. It's not like he's missing any components. He's all together himself and always is and always will be. He's never lacking in anything. And yet we, we think that if we can grab a hold of something, it's going to create possibility for us when in reality, mark it out, this is a principle, when you, when you think that it's going to create possibilities for you when in reality it creates limitations in your life. There's a lot here on the subject of dependence and freedom that we might could look at some other time. In fact, John says this in John 8, verse 34. He that commits sin is a slave to sin, so that we place ourselves under a different master. And this is exactly what Adam and Eve are doing. And so all of this has taken place, just so we understand, both Adam and Eve are present. The serpent is speaking to Eve, and so this is where we see the dialogue. But it's not as though Adam is innocent. Adam is very much watching what's going on. In fact, when you look at what the, how the Scripture speaks of Eve, when he, when he says you, he's speaking in the plural. All of these references are in the plural form. So you know that what's taking place is that this is a conversation. While it's a dialogue with Eve, Adam is present. It is inclusive of. It is both, it is both of them there who understand what has taken place. And Adam, the Bible, Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.14, while it was not Adam who was deceived, 1 Timothy 2.14 says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived as in the transgression. So you say, we see it was her fault. And that's a really nice thing to, you know, that's a nice little uh, comeback, right, guys? You like to use that one. Well, it was, it was her fault to begin with, right? Yeah. How did, how did you like sleeping out in the garage last night? <laughs> that, that one go well. You, you win that argument or, yeah, you know where you're going to be sleeping. You know good and well. Now, certainly, Eve was deceived. That's what the Bible says, so we have to go with that, right? But Adam knows all along. Why didn't he intercede for his wife? Why didn't he stand in the gap? Why, did, why, why, why wasn't he more spiritually astute in the moment and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, honey. We're going out to eat tonight. You shouldn't be eating that. <laughs> okay? You, don't, don't do that. That's not going to be good for you, for me. Let's, no, don't do that. Why didn't he protect her? Why didn't he wash her in the word like Ephesians 5 talks about men? Caring for his wife like Christ loved the church. Why didn't he do that? But, so we're all culpable. We're all responsible. The point being, and there's so much here that we could delve into, the point is, is that when the two of them, when, when Adam and Eve, when they turned in on themselves in this kind of self-love, this kind of we want this kind of thing, we want this for ourselves, they not only turned away from God, but they ultimately turned away from each other. Because the moment they disrupted their relationship with what God said, the very moment it happened, the very moment it happened, you know what they realized? Their eyes were opened and they, and they realized they were naked. The first sense of realization, their first sense of discovery was they were naked. Their, their sense of innocence had been lost. Their sense of innocence was gone. And the repercussions of that continued in a paradise lost, in a, in a sense of innocence being broken. Their eyes opened. They saw things that they had not seen before. In other words, it changed how they saw themselves and how they saw God. It changed those things. And so they knew more, but the knowledge that they received, they couldn't handle. And it changed the dynamic of their relationships. Mistrust and alienation were replaced, replaced, excuse me, security and intimacy. That was one of the results. 
They sewed together fig leaves. They tried to cover themselves. And here we have the first religious act, the first human effort to, to try to make things right. And that's what religion is about. Religion is what can I do to try to cover myself before a holy and righteous God? What can I do? And we will come up with everything and anything that we can imagine. They came up with some fig leaves, okay? They just did, they did what they could. But it is the first human effort. That's the first religious expression that we see by man and false religion is born. Let me see what I can do to cover up for my mistakes. Sin's... Our sin needs to be covered. There's no question about that. It needs to be covered, but it must be covered by the Lord, as we will see. And so this fellowship is broken with the Lord. They hid themselves because of what? Because of their shame, because of their guilt, because of their disobedience. They go and they hide behind the trees that they could have been eating all the fruit off of, right? Here they are, fig leaves covering the best of them up, right? And, and then they go stand behind the trees. And, they're, and then the Bible says that in verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You know, it's an interesting expression. It's like every other time that they had heard the Lord, they knew, they knew the Lord. They, they, we, they had such a close relationship with the Lord that when the Lord visited with them in the garden, they knew every time he was there. It was, it was a longed for moment, but they were afraid now. They were fearful. It's interesting. I mean, knowing the sound, the heartbeat, knowing the footsteps of God, to be so close with him and to know that he's here and that it's a delight as opposed to, oh no, oh no, I'm gonna have to stand. He's here. You know, as Christians, we have the opportunity to stand before God, not in a sense of fear, but in a sense of, in a sense of awe, in a sense of gratefulness for what he has done for us. Our shame, our guilt, our disobedience, they push us away. And so you have this dialogue that takes place, and you can almost imagine what's going on here in the garden, because it, it's, like, it's like Adam, you know, he's culpable, you know, he's, he's responsible for this to a large extent, along with Eve. And he says, shh, 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 And they're over there hiding, thinking, God can't see me. <laughs> but they are enlightened human beings at this moment, right? They just ate of this fruit of the forbidden tree, the knowledge of good and evil. They're enlightened. Like God doesn't see. Like he doesn't see. And so this dialogue is taking place. And then there's this passing of the buck, right? You know, what, what happened? It's that woman, Lord. It's that, that woman you gave me. Remember her? You know, that, that whole line. So, so that's Adam's ex explanation. I was afraid, he says. Uh, I, he felt justified. Well, her. And, and, and this sense of, you know, we have to exonerate ourselves in some kind of way. So, so here's my explanation. Here's my justification. And now I'm fully exonerated. But it didn't help him, did it? No more than our reasons for self-justification and things that we do in the end help us. They don't really don't bring any peace at all. The bottom line is that we've sinned and we just have to recognize it. We have to deal with it. The reality is we are broken just like Adam and Eve. We, we've sinned. And it's, a, and it's not a good thing. It's a serious matter, so serious, so serious that God would send his son. This sin is, is, a, is, is a definite thing effect, affecting our lives. Some fraternity brothers um, were playing a trick on, on another brother in the fraternity house. So you know what Limeburger cheese is? So while he was asleep, and they, they took some Limeburger cheese and they rubbed it on his mustache. Well, he woke up about an hour later and he said, this room stinks, you know, took a deep breath, got up from his bed, walked out in the hallway, took another deep breath, said, this hallway stinks. Not sure where all this was coming from. He walked through the fraternity house, out the front door, took a deep breath and said, this whole world stinks. Not realizing that the problem was just right underneath his own nose. This world is a mess. 
But you know why it is? Because I am. Because you are. You're a mess. But the good news is coming. <laughs> okay? It's dark right now. You've you got to feel it. This is a story. It's designed to lead us through a journey of understanding what is this story that God has for us? What is this great story you keep talking about? Well, we look not only at the deception and the disobedience, but we see God's deliverance in verse 14. We see the pronouncement, really, it's the sentencing of man, the sentencing of the serpent, the sentencing of the woman. They're all very important, very important to our understanding of redemption. But let's skip ahead for just a moment. We'll come back to the sentencing of the, of the serpent in, in, in just a moment. But I want you to see in verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you will bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So one of the first things that we'll see is that because of this broken relationship with God, all of a sudden, human relationships are fractured. This is, what, this is what's going to take place. The relationship conflict that you will have with your husband is going to be evident. Husband and wife, as good and as ordained as marriage is, it's not always easy, is it? Can I get an amen out there? <laughs> yeah. It's not easy, this marriage thing. And so this relational conflict is going to begin. He's saying this is going to happen. And so if I could put it maybe in some terms that we might, in, in some maybe alliterated terms in my way of thinking poetically about this, is that there is this labor and delivery that she's going to go through, and it's not going to be easy, okay? But then this, the second sentence is, is for Adam, and there is going to be a labor and discouragement that is going to follow him. And see, we, when you read that, you see the description beginning in verse 17, or excuse me, in, in, yeah, in verse 17, and he said to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth. So in other words, he's saying, you're going to sweat. It's not, it's, you're going to labor and you're going to become discouraged because you're going you're to plant your crops and you're going to labor in this world and there is gonna, you're going to have this battle with the environment is what he's basically telling them. You're going to have this environmental clash. You're going to invest in something and it's, it's going to be discouraging to you you're going to work hard by the sweat of your brow and a world that was designed in a beautiful garden designed for your greatest sense of human fulfillment that is now changed and the world that you will live in is going to be a world in a downward environmental spiral so that the frustrations that you will encounter as you try to cultivate the earth that I've given you and I told you to cultivate so that lives human beings you created in my image those you and, and Eve created in my image you were designed to flourish and to grow and to experience all this created order that I gave you you're going to become di you're going to become disillusioned with the world that you live in because the environment is going to push back on you and boy do we understand a little bit about a, an environment pushing back on us don't we Anybody had a hurricane pass through your way lately? You know that wasn't God's design, right? It's evidence. And by the way, don't pray for the hurricane not to come here and go to somebody else's place. Not a good prayer thing, okay? We live in a world that's been turned upside down because of sin. And the Bible tells us in Romans that God, that the world, the earth is groaning for its day of redemption so the world, even itself, there's this clash with the environment that now is occurring. And he's saying, Adam, as you seek to bring about the harvest of this world, it will push back on you. And then the last thing, really, which really was the first sentence, but I, I save it because in it there is contained both a word of challenge and sentencing of devastation upon the serpent but there is a gospel message here as well because he says to the serpent because you've done this cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field on your belly you will go and dust you shall eat in all the days of your life i will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring there is going to be this disruption of this constant combat this constant warring, this enmity that's going to exist between Satan 
the seed of the serpent, and all of this demonic horde, there's going to be this constant battle that exists. There's going to be this loathing, this serpent that was once upright is now going to slither on the ground downright. This one who, who was tempting Eve and Adam is one who's going to experience ultimate destruction. He's going to strike the heel of the seed of the woman is what he says. And I want you to follow me because this is wherein lies the, 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 the good news. It's in this little nugget in verse 15, what Bible scholars have called the proto-euangelion. It means the gospel before the gospel. Proto is meaning before or the first. Euangelion means gospel. In other words, before Jesus came, there is this message of the hope of his coming. It's the first gospel message that we find. This is why we go back to Genesis just like Jesus did when he walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And the Bible says that he reasoned with them. He spoke to them from Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. What did he take from Moses' writing? He went back to Genesis 3. Basically to indicate that he is the fulfillment of this. That he is... That gospel that Moses wrote of that was inspired word of God, that gospel that once was spoken, even in its seed form, is now come to fruition. It's standing in front of you. This gospel is before you. This is the story of Jesus. And so this first gospel is the gospel that while Satan may, he may strike a blow to the heel, there, there, there is what appears to be a blow struck by Satan at the cross, but ultimately one, two, three days later, and Jesus overcomes this, right? Death held in the grave. And so the greatest story, the good news of the story is that while this world is broken and Adam and Eve have blown it, is that God's not through with them yet and he's not through with you yet. That's the good news today. If you walk away with a sense of heaviness and you realize, yes, my relationships are broken with people and they're broken because I know today my relationship is broken with God. The reason you're broken with people is because you're broken with God. That's what's going on here. But the good news is that your brokenness with God can be restored. And you know why? Because God sent forth his son as the one to redeem us. He's the one who's come forth. He's the gospel. He is the one. He's the story. And so the serpent will eat dust. It's a, it's a, it's a metaphor for humiliation. In other words, God's going to make it a point. He's going to trample upon him. And when you look at the word of God, for instance, in Romans 16 and verse 20, some interesting things occur here. At the end of Paul's letter to the Romans, he writes this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What did Paul know? Paul knew what Moses knew. Paul knew what Moses knew. Paul knew that ultimately Satan was defeated. He was defeated at the cross. The good news today in our brokenness, in our effort to exert independence and to discover this new life apart from God, in our brokenness and realization that we have become dissatisfied, God doesn't say, see, I told you so. I'm gonna just let you do, just, just languish in that. I'm not gonna do, I'm just gonna let you just languish in all this, this mess that you've created for yourself. I'm not gonna leave you there. No, God sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice. This, this is the story of Jesus 2,000 years ago, his decisive victory over Satan through his death and his resurrection. This is the central idea, and how does God do this? He doesn't take some fig leaves and cover them up. That's man's effort. He takes an animal. In verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins. And he clothed them. It won't be that easy as just taking some fig leaves and saying, you know, you know, covering yourself and trying to come up with some kind of human effort to please God. No, God came up with the method of salvation. He came up with the gospel, the good news, the plan of salvation for you and for me today. This is the storyline that we will track throughout the Bible as we study and we read it together. And that is the good news is that God sent forth his son who died, who shed his blood for us, just like that animal did in the 
garden and gave up its skin so that they could be clothed. The Lord Jesus Christ has clothed us in his own righteousness. You know why I know that? It's not because I made it up. Let me tell you that. It's not because I came away with some great understanding on my own. I know it because this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5. It says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death, Death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one's trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Now he's not through. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through the one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. It's not through. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. That's God's word interpreting his word. We don't have to make this stuff up. Today, today, no matter what you've done, no matter how you've interjected yourself and said, Lord God, my independence from you, no matter what you've done, and we have all in one way or another committed principally the same sin that Adam and Eve committed. We decided that we were going to do our own thing in spite of what God said. Not just once, but I know in my life, and I'd venture to say if you were to take a spiritual inventory of your life, many, many, many times, because the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life they, they rage within us. But this one named Jesus, he came and he died decisively dealing with our death, decisively dealing with our shame, decisively dealing with our guilt, decisively dealing with our sin. And yes, by one man sin entered into the world, but by one, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are made righteous. If you will believe on him today, right now, if you will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, so what does that look like? What, how do I do that? For me, I was a kid, a teenager, lying in my bed at night after a friend told me the story of the return of the Lord, realizing, resonating in me without any understanding of the word of God because I had not read it, the Holy Spirit of God was convincing me and convicting me just as he's doing in your life right now some of you you prayed you received christ right in a worship service just like this that's great some of you may be kneeling at your bedside or wherever you might have been but all of us at some point or another we have to make the decision as to whether or not in this moment we are going to receive this gospel a gospel that god has been trying to communicate to us since the very beginning when we blew it now that's good news, and I don't know anybody who has better news for me and you today. Let's bow our heads, and if you're here today and you're saying, yes, I want to make that decision. I want, I want to confess Christ as my Savior. I want to receive the salvation that you're talking about. If that's your decision, I want you just to right now yield your heart before the Lord. and Just say, Lord God, I receive what you have for me today. I humble my heart before you. I confess my sins to you. I realize that what I've done, I've done first and foremost against you. And it has affected not only you, but it has affected the people in my life.
would you forgive me now and cleanse me and start in me something new, creating me something new. I confess you as my Savior because you died for me. I confess you as my Lord because you rose from the dead. I confess you as the one and only who can give me life everlasting.